talking about the structure of the verb group, and remember that we said the verb group always includes at least the main verb. So the smallest type of verb group that you can have in any sentence will be one that just includes the main verb. If you have a sentence like, Mary cried, what is within the verb group there is just the verb cried. That's the main verb of the sentence. So the whole verb group is comprised of the verb cried. That's it. And the whole verb phrase is comprised of just the verb cried because we don't have any complements following the verb. There's no direct object, there's no indirect object, etc. Because we have an intransitive verb, right? So, in fact, if you look at the structure of the verb group in English, what we observe is that the main verb always occurs last within the verb group, and then we have an ordering of which auxiliary verbs occur before the main verb. And that ordering is as follows. First, we have modal verbs. Then we have perfect auxiliaries. Then we have progressive auxiliaries. And then we have passive auxiliaries. So I know that a lot of this terminology might be familiar to you, but maybe you don't feel so comfortable with saying, okay, that is um, the passive voice and that's the progressive aspect and labeling the details of all of this information. That's what we're going to do today. So by the end of you having viewed all of the segments of this lecture, you should be familiar with what is modal, what is perfect, what is progressive, and what is passive. And we're gonna go through a lot of examples because as you know, the only way to understand linguistics is to do linguistics. So let's think about the perfect auxiliary because we've already talked about the modal. We know that modals are verbs like would, will, shall, should, all of those guys. So let's talk about the perfect auxiliary. The perfect auxiliary is formed always with some type of verb have. So that is how you know, that's the tip off, that you have an auxiliary that's the perfect form. Have plus following it, the past participle. Remember we said the past participle, it's kind of a bad name for this guy because necessarily it can occur with any tense, but it's that form of the verb that is used, for example, John had eaten the pizza had eaten, eaten is not a tensed form. It doesn't mean that it happened in the past, the future, whatever. It's just a form that had requires because it's this type of perfect auxiliary. So eaten, the E-N, is what we call the past participle marker. And so if you look at what's happening with examples where you have the perfect auxiliary, so you have a sentence like she had slept for five hours. Remember that in the assignment that I had given to you when you were looking at the structure of the verb phrase and you were determining, okay, do I have an intransitive verb phrase? Do I have ditransitive? What is the structural sort that I have here? You uh, were able to leave out anything that was optional. Anything that you didn't have to have in the sentence, you could have left out and that would have been fine. That wouldn't have changed anything about the structure of the verb phrase. So for that same reason, we're going to leave out anything optional, anything that is not obligatory in this sentence, we're gonna leave out because it's not going to be crucial in telling us information about the structure of the verb group. So when you have a sentence, she had slept for five hours, for five hours is telling you, okay, how long did she sleep for? But you could have had a possible English sentence just by saying she had slept, you know? That would be okay as a sentence without the four or five hours. So in general, whenever we see any of this extra material in the sentence, we're going to get rid of it. And we can just cross it out and know that we don't have to think about where it's fitting because it's not fitting within the verb group. It's in another place. So then we have the sentence, she had slept. And looking at that, we know the subject is she, and the predicate is had slept. Therefore, we know that the verb group is comprised of had and slept. And as always, main verb is on the rightmost side. So slept is a period. 
appearing where it should. And then on the left-hand side, we always have auxiliaries. And depending upon which word you have here, you're going to have auxiliaries of different types. So in this example, because it's a form of the verb have, in other words, if it were had, or have, or having, or have, anything that is in the form of the verb have is going to give you what we call a perfect auxiliary. So you're going to label it as perfect. And then under that label, you're going to put what tense will you have had that he is telling you that this is past tense. So this is what the structure of your verb group is going to look like. And when I ask you to analyze the verb groups, I give you the assignments and on the part of the exam, when I ask you about the verb groups, I'm going to ask you only about the verb groups. So in other words, you don't have to provide structures for all of the other material in a sentence. Just focus in on the verb group itself, the main verb, and all the helping verbs, and give the structure of that unit. Okay. So let's look at some more examples with perfect. If you have a sentence like John has the money. Okay, so we're looking to see what's the subject and predicate. We know John is our subject. The predicate is has the money. If we were thinking about what type of predicate we have, we would know that the money is the direct object of the verb has, and therefore we have monotransitive. And right now we're looking just at the verb group itself. So what is the verb group in this sentence? It's just the verb has, right? This is the only verb that is appearing in this sentence. So the verb group is comprised of only the verb has. What does that then mean about the verb has in this sentence? In this sentence, the verb has is serving as a main verb. When you say John has the money, it means something like John possesses the money. So used with that meaning, it's no longer a perfect auxiliary. It's a main verb. And therefore, you're just going to have the label. And then you're showing that because you have third person singular S here, this is going to be present tense. That is all the material within the verb group. So think about it this way. If you're looking at a verb group, it has a single verb. It doesn't matter which verb it is. It can be the verb have. It can be a form of the verb be. It can be anything whatsoever. That will always and only be your complete verb group. However, what if you have an example where you have more than just the verb have? So you have within the verb group something following the verb have. So if you have something like Mary should have. Mary should have left. So what's going on with this sentence? Subject is going to be Mary, so we're going to forget about that. Predicate should have left, the rest of the sentence. Nothing here is optional, so we don't have to worry about erasing anything or getting rid of any material. And then we ask ourselves, okay, what's the verbal material? What is included within the verb group here? And you have the form should. Well, oh, that looks like the past tense, and it's a modal verb. So this is going to be within the verb group. Have, aha, a form of the verb have. So this is going to be in the verb group. Left, another example of a past parcel. It's ending in the irregular T. Instead of taking ED, it appears with T. So it's a past participle, and it's what? Of course, the main verb, because it's the last verb. So all of this is going to be your verb group. And notice that this time, you have more than just a single auxiliary verb. So in other words, within the auxiliary label, you're going to have two separate layers. You're going to have first, what you're saying is that all of these are auxiliary verbs, and then what type are they? Should is going to be, as we were saying, a modal verb, and it's in the past tense because it has D at the end, so we're going to label it as past, and then have we know it's always, always, always going to be the perfect form. Whatever you have, have, has, having, any form of the verb have when it appears as an auxiliary 
it's always a marker of perfect. So always you're going to have the label of perfect here. And then when you ask, okay, what's the label for this sentence? The label for the sentence is going to be past modal perfect. So we say that this sentence is in the past modal perfect tense. That's the label for the sentence in terms of what's going on within the verb group. So remember, for this section, we're only looking at the material within the verb group. So what we see is an example of what we started talking about at the beginning, which was that if you have more than one auxiliary, you have an order among the auxiliaries. So Mary should have left, it's fine, with the modal first and the perfect second, but if you said Mary have should left, then it's just really weird, right? It's not the way that an English speaker would produce this sentence. So why is that the case? That's the case because the internal structure of the verb group includes an ordering of each and every auxiliary. If you have a modal verb, it has to be the first one in the verb group. If you don't have an auxiliary, I'm sorry, if you don't have a modal, so Mary had left, now had is the only auxiliary within the verb group. But if you have a modal present, it has to be first. So that's the interesting thing about, from the point of view of syntax, you know, thinking about verbs and auxiliary verbs in English is that they follow regular patterns. And if you were only thinking about the meanings of sentences from the point of view of, well, the meaning of a sentence is comprised of the meaning of all of its parts, right? All the words that constitute the sentence, then it would be pretty puzzling. Why should English be structured in such a way that we can say Mary should have left, but we can't say Mary left should have, or Mary have should left? In English, it's impossible, and it's not impossible because somebody told us that it's impossible. It's impossible because we all have the intuition that this is just not a natural sentence of English. So this is what we're trying to describe. We're trying to describe what Everybody who knows English unconsciously knows in their mind about producing and understanding English sentences. So we start a modal with have. If you have something like, kids First thing you're going to do when you're talking about the verb group is get rid of your subject. So the kids is your subject. You can leave that out. Your verb group is going to be within your predicate. And you can see here that had eaten the pizza, the pizza is the direct object of eaten. It's going to mean that that whole verb phrase is going to be monotransitive. But we're not worried about that now. Now we're focusing just on the verb group. So what are the constituents of the verb group? Had and eaten. How do you know that had is? part of the verb group, you've got past tense here. So for sure that's part of the verb group. And look at eaten. Ian, you have the past participle form. So we're going to have our verb group structure. And notice that we only have two items here. We may have two, we may have three, we may have four, we may, right? It get, you can get as complicated um, as you can conceive of an event as being interpreted. So you can have a very, very long sequence of auxiliary verbs, that's possible. And so since this is a type of auxiliary, and we're saying the type that it is, is perfect because it is a form of the verb have, and we know that it's in the past tense because we have had, as opposed to has. If you say, Mary has eaten the pizza, this is going to be exactly the same in terms of its structure. The only thing that's going to be different is that the label here is going to be present. So we say that this sentence is in the past perfect. So it's traditional to put the label of the tense first and then the label of the auxiliaries. So this is a past perfect sentence. And similar to this, whether it's formed with a modal or other items, Whenever you have the have, 
Virginia Auxiliary Verb Group, you know it is an example of some sort of perfect. So we'll always, always, always be labeled as perfect. Okay, so we talked about modals and we talked about the perfect form of the auxiliary. What else can you have in English? You can have what we call the progressive. So the progressive is what? It's formed in English with two things. A form of the verb be plus the ing form of the following verb. So notice that in English, unlike in many languages of the world, you form different tenses by doing two things. You have a particular form of the auxiliary plus the following verb has to be in a particular form. Let's say the past participle or the present participle. Many languages of the world will just take the main verb and they will add to the end a marker which will tell you basically what we express in English with all of these auxiliaries. So should have, might have, will be, all of these things get expressed in many, many languages just by marking the verb at the end with an inflection that carries that information. So English is interesting because it has this system which is more complex. You need the auxiliary verb, but you also need the correct form of the following verb, depending upon which auxiliary you have. So, for example, if you have a sentence like, the smoke was rising. The smoke was rising. So you want to know what's going on with the verb group of this sentence. You want to isolate out just the main verb plus all the auxiliary verbs. So you're going to identify your subject as the smoke. And you're going to have was rising. Aha, what's going on here? Notice that you have a form of the verb to be. What are the forms of the verb to be? To be may appear in many different forms. It may appear as be, been, being, was, is, were. All of these guys are different forms of the same verb. They're all forms of the verb be. So just like when you have have or had, they're both instances of the same verb, the verb have. When you have the verb be, it's similar in the sense that it can either be a main verb or an auxiliary verb. So which one is it here? When you know that you have was as a type of form of the verb be, depends on what you say about rising. So in other words, is rising a verb here? Is it um, serving as something else, like maybe an adjective? So when you say the smoke was rising, is rising serving as a subject complement and telling you something about the smoke? And the way that you can determine whether this item is a verb or is an adjective is if you try to intensify it. So if you can say very before this item, then that means that what we're dealing with is um, an adjective, not a verb. So the smoke was very rising. That sounds really weird. It's not a sentence that we would say in English. But if you said the man was very tall, ha, very tall works as a modifier of the man. And therefore, in that sentence, you have the main verb be the was. And then very tall is something that's describing the subject of the sentence. It's not part of the verb group. The only thing in the verb group are the verbal items, right? So in this sentence, you can't have very, you cannot. And therefore, you know that this guy rising has to be considered a verb, and here it's the main verb, it's occurring to the right. So your verb group is going to look like this. You're going to have to the right, as always, the main verb rising, and then over here on the left, all of your auxiliaries, which are exactly one in this example, and we know what it is, it's the progressive auxiliary. Why do we know it's the progressive auxiliary? Because it's a form of the verb to be, followed by something with ing. That's exactly what it means to be progressive. Something that is a form of the verb to be, followed by something with ing. So we're going to say that this guy is progressive. And what about the tense of this sentence? 
So we want to label the tense of the sentence, and we know that that depends upon the form of the first verb in the sequence. It doesn't depend upon what's going on with the main verb, because the main verb is already down way at the end of the verb group. It's the first verb that always decides what is the tense. So was, we can see, is in past tense. If we had switched it to is, the smoke is rising, then we would have the same structure, but we would have the present tense. So you would say that for the label of this sentence, what type of verb would you have? A past progressive. We will label this as past progressive. Okay, so what we've seen so far is that we have modals. We have um, perfect, and we have progressive. And if we have all three of them together in the same sentence, what's going to happen? We predict that they should occur in that order. First the modal, then the perfect, and then the progressive. So let's see whether that is in fact the case. If you have a sentence like, Kids would have been sleeping at five o'clock. So we want to see what is going on with the internal structure of the material within the verb group here. First thing we're going to do, get rid of our subject. So the kids, we're going to get our subject, we're going to forget about that. And next we see ah, our predicate's pretty long here, right? Would have been sleeping at five o'clock. Notice that there's a piece of the material here that is optional. What could you have left out? You could have left out at five o'clock. You could have just said the sentence, the kids would have been sleeping. Finished. So therefore, at 5 o'clock, is that extra material that you were talking about? You can completely leave it out. It's not going to make a difference in terms of the basic structure of the sentence. So anything that is extra material, cross it out. You don't have to worry about how it fits into the structure. So then we're left with would have been sleeping. What's going on here? Well, we know that would is a modal word showing up in the past tense because of D. We know that have is a modal word because it's a form of the word have, the perfect form. And then we see this B over here. What is this? It's B plus EN because have requires the past participle of the following verb. And this B is introducing the progressive because you have ING on the following verb here. So what do we have here? When I have a verb group, that is made up of, first of all, label the main verb, because that will always be all of the information that you provide about the main verb. The main verb is never going to also serve another function. It's just the main verb that's going to be So on this side, we're going to have all of our auxiliary verbs, and we want to express what is the order that we have to have in English. So as we see here, we first have the modal, and this particular one is in the past tense. Next we have form of the verb have. Any form of the verb have as an auxiliary verb has to be perfect. And this is labeled as perfect. And notice nothing after the first verb is going to have a tense mark. Nothing is going to say past tense, future tense, etc. because only the first verb will appear with tense all in English. And then we have this other guy, Ben, right? What's Ben doing? And then Ben was serving as the marker for the progressive because it's E plus ING on the following word. So progressive is for Ben. So if you wanted to label then the whole sentence, where you're going to have, you're going to have a past modal perfect progressive. So past modal perfect. And notice that we don't really have a choice about that. It has to appear with that order of items. In other words, if you try to do it with any other order, if you try to make it a progressive, perfect, past, modal. So if you try to say the kids sleeping then have would 
at five o'clock. You just can't do that. English does not generate a sentence like that. Therefore, we say that necessarily within the auxiliary group, we have this order of first the modal, then the perfect, and then the progressive. And in a minute, we'll talk about some other forms that we 